Mr. Beat presents Presidential Elections, elections in American, American History. The 41st presidential election in American history took place on November 2nd, 1948. After Franklin Roosevelt died, Harry Truman took over, and soon after, Nazi Germany surrendered to the Allied forces. Now, all eyes were on the Pacific theater of the war. Japan was clearly suffering, but it didn't seem like they were going to surrender anytime soon. I mean, Japanese pilots were conducting suicide attacks, known as kamikaze, aimed at warships. While some historians debate whether or not the Japanese government was actually ready to surrender in the summer of 1945, Truman took action and decided to drop the first and only atomic bombs ever dropped on another country. He did it to end the war quickly and to try to save the lives of millions of both Americans and Japanese who would have kept on fighting otherwise. While today people still debate whether or not the action was justified, it's hard to deny how bold the move was by Truman. And it worked. Japan finally surrendered shortly after Americans dropped two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The war was over, and this time Truman made it a point to not make the same mistakes that were made after World War I. Instead of punishment, Truman called for aid. He pushed for the Marshall Plan, which had Americans give money to Western European countries to help them rebuild their economies after the war. They would also help rebuild Japan. Truman's presidency was a huge turning point for world affairs. Sure, World War II is over, but now he was all about fueling the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Truman was cold with Joseph Stalin the moment he took over, and some argue he helped start the Cold War with his strained relationship with the Soviet dictator. I guess who could blame him? It's not like Stalin was a lovable kitty cat or anything. Truman's foreign policy objectives became famously known as the Truman Doctrine, with the main objective being always to defeat communism wherever it appeared. Truman called for a to Turkey and Greece, where communist revolutions threatened. And he supported the Berlin Airlift, basically giving the middle finger to the Soviet Union. Back home, Truman was the first president to actively call for civil rights legislation. He even desegregated the armed forces. I've read several quotes by Truman that are pretty racist, and maybe he did this just to get the black vote. But man, this was a huge step in 1948. Anyway, after all this, Truman had a very low approval rating. It seemed not nearly as many Americans liked him like they did FDR. Not only that, several people in his own political party were turning against him. They tried to get Dwight Eisenhower, the World War II hero and former chief of staff of the United States Army, to be the nominee instead of Truman. But they failed as Eisenhower refused to run. Eventually, the Democrats went ahead and went with Truman as their nominee, with Albin Barkley, the Senate minority leader, as his running mate. Though Truman tried to moderate his civil rights positions, some Democrats were like, nuh-uh. And while walked out of the Democratic Convention. They started a new political party called the States Rights Democratic Party. Members of this party became known as Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats wanted to keep the policy of racial segregation in the South and allow states to keep their infamous Jim Crow laws. They nominated Strom Thurmond, the governor of South Carolina and the guy who led the walk out of the Democratic Convention, for president, and Fielding Wright, the governor of Mississippi, as his running mate. Fielding Wright, more like Fielding Wrong, <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. Anyway, it wasn't just the Dixiecrats who left the Democratic Party. Some Democrats argued that Truman's civil rights reforms didn't go far enough for blacks. They wanted more. Former Vice President Henry Wallace, who, remember, would have been president if it weren't for Truman taking his place in the 1944 election, disagreed with Truman on many issues. In fact, Truman had fired Wallace from his position as the Secretary of Commerce after Wallace talked trash about Truman's foreign policy. Wallace opposed the Truman Doctrine and wanted to get rid of the House Un-American Activities Committee, which he thought violated civil liberties. Wallace also called for more regulation against giant corporations and an expanded welfare state. Naturally, opponents called him a secret communist. Wallace and his supporters would also leave the Democratic Party to form a third progressive party called the, um... Progressive Party. Can't we get more creative with names? Again, this was not the same Progressive Party as Teddy Roosevelt or Robert La Follette. It was a new one. This Progressive Party officially nominated Wallace as their nominee, with Glenn Taylor, a senator from Idaho, as his running mate. Taylor had earned a reputation as being that one weird politician in D.C., a guy known as the Singing Cowboy because he would sing songs and ride his horse up the steps of the Capitol. Not at the same time, my 
mind you. So Wallace and Taylor were definitely unique. When they campaigned, they made a point of speaking to racially integrated audiences, even in the South. And because of that, Southerners sometimes threw food like eggs and tomatoes at them. Oh crap. I spent so much time talking about Democrats and former Democrats that I almost forgot to talk about the Republicans. Well, they tried for Dwight Eisenhower too, but after Eisenhower declined, many familiar names stood out for the nomination. Thomas Dewey, Robert Taft, Arthur Vandenberg, and Harold Stassen, who were all in the running in 1944, and some who didn't run in 1944, notably Earl Warren, the governor of California. The Republicans decided to play it safe and go once again with Thomas Dewey, who was still the governor of New York. They nominated Warren as his running mate. Dewey and Warren, as governors of two of the largest states in the country, made up a strong ticket, and with the Democratic Party fractured, nearly every poll favored them to win. Dewey made sure he did whatever he could to just avoid major mistakes. He often was vague on policy and in speeches. As I said before, Truman was not a popular president and even had a hard time raising money for his campaign. Shortly before Election Day, journalists were so confident that Dewey would win that they went ahead and wrote articles ahead of time proclaiming him as the next president. And here are the results. Dewey won. Just kidding. And what is considered to be the greatest election upset in American history, Harry Truman won, remaining the 33rd president in American history. No one seemed to see this one coming, and yet Truman had won by more than 2 million votes. He sure had some fun holding up this newspaper. Truman received 303 electoral votes and 49.6% of the popular vote. Thomas Dewey received 189 electoral votes and 45.1% of the popular vote. As expected, Strom Thurmond did well in the South. He received 39 electoral votes and 2.4% of the popular vote. While he didn't receive any electoral votes, Henry Wallace received a solid 2.4% of the popular vote as well, getting just under 19,000 votes less than Thurmond for fourth place. Albin Barkley became the 35th vice president in American history. The election of 1948 will forever be known as the underdog election, inspiring future candidates who are behind in the polls to think they always had a chance. I'll see you for the next election, buddy.